with Juan Gonzalez. Well, a heat wave from Boston to Baghdad to Beijing over the past few days is setting record-breaking temperatures in cities across the world. In Beijing, the mercury level hit a near-record 105 degrees. In Baghdad, it was 113. In Kuwait, 122. Here in the United States, cities along the East Coast, from New York to Charlotte, all topped 100 degrees. Boston, New York, Philadelphia and Newark all set new record highs. Indeed, 2010 is set to be one of the world's hottest years on record, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. The global average surface temperature for the first five months of the year was the warmest on record. Meanwhile, a new analysis says the world is headed for an average temperature rise that far exceeds pledges at the Copenhagen Climate Conference last year. According to the Cli Climate Interactive Scoreboard, temperatures are expected to rise nearly 4 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, double the maximum 2 degrees discussed in Copenhagen. A separate analysis from the Potsdam Institute in Germany says there's virtually no chance current pledges will keep temperatures below 2 degrees and predicts an increase of 3.5 degrees. Well, a new book by geopolitical analyst and columnist Gwyn Dyer imagines what the politics and demographics of the world might look like if temperatures continue to rise. Dyer writes, quote, in this world, our worries are not just hotter summers, bigger hurricanes, rising sea levels and polar bears swimming for their lives. We're trying to avoid mega deaths from mass starvation and quite possibly from nuclear wars, and the odds aren't good, he writes. The book's called Climate Wars, the Fight for Survival as the World Overheats. Author Gwen Dyer joins us here in our studio, longtime journalist, columnist and lecturer on international affairs. His twice-weekly columns published in 175 newspapers in some 45 countries. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you. Can you lay out the scenario, um, what you see could happen? The military themselves have begun making plans and making provisions for the kind of roles they foresee themselves having in a warming world. And really what drives almost all of their scenarios is that the principal impact of warming on human beings is on the food supply. That the hotter it gets, the less food we can grow. About one degree Celsius average global temperature rise, you lose 10 percent of the supply, global grain production rule of thumb. Um, and there's no slack in the system. I mean, we're eating all that we grow. And so what they see is uh, a variety of ills arising from a sh an absolute shortage of food. Refugees, slash, you know, coming up against borders that don't want to let them in, but, you know, you're starving back home. Your farm is dried up and blown away. Um, you're trying to get into a place where there's still some food and they don't want to let you in. It gets very ugly in that sort of border. Failed states, a government that cannot feed its own people does not survive. I mean, that's, you know, job one, keep the people alive. If you can't do that, you have no credibility left. And in some cases, actual interstate wars, because um, in very many parts of the world, several countries share the same river, which is fine when there's enough water to go around. When there's not, uh, the upstream country has got a really serious temptation to just hold on to enough water for itself and, and to hell with the downstream countries, who then have the choice of fight or starve. Um, I mean, India and Pakistan, uh, Egypt versus the countries further up the Nile, um, Iraq versus Turkey. I think there might be a war between Iraq and Turkey today if Iraq wasn't flat on its back because the Turks are holding the water back and there's no water in the Euphrates River this year. But isn't the, the assumption uh, that uh, all of this dislocation will be created as, uh, uh, as the temperature rises based on the existing inequities in the society, uh, in the world in general, continuing, where uh, the wealthier countries are obviously dominating uh, control of the food supply and also the consumption of the food supply? Well, that is perfectly true. But what, is, what makes the matter considerably worse is that not everybody gets hit as hard by the, the, the warming. The countries further away from the equator, temperate zone, countries like the, most of the United States, bits of it are in the subtropics, but most of the United States is in the temperate zone, Europe, Japan, they're relatively unharmed by this until we get way deep into climate change. I mean, you'd have to be about three degrees before they start losing food production. But the tropics and the subtropics, which takes in about two-thirds of the world, get hit very hard very early. Um, so that there, you know, the existing inequities are enormously magnified because it is precisely the poorer countries that are losing food production. Um, but so much so that there's an absolute global shortage, which means, of course, the poorest people 
Sorry to start. Let's turn to the Pentagon's view of climate change. Earlier this year, the Pentagon highlighted climate concerns in its main public document on military strategy released every four years, the Quadrennial Defense Review, or QDR. This is Michelle Flournoy, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. This is the first QDR to address climate and energy issues, uh, which are both significant factors in the future security environment. Climate change could increase demand for U.S. forces and humanitarian response, creating a new operating environment in the Arctic and requiring adaptation in our own facilities and systems. DOD's enormous dependence on energy makes its operations vulnerable to disruptions in energy flows uh, and to price fluctuations. DOD aims to be a leader in the, in the government uh, to improve sustainability, resource efficiency, increase of uh, renewable energy supplies, and reduction of energy demand to improve operational effectiveness and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that is the Pentagon's view. Now, I was really struck, Gwen Dyer, when you described in this book how here was the Bush administration for years denying human-caused climate change, or that's going to have any dramatic effect, behind the scenes, its own Pentagon is working to deal with dramatic effects of climate change. Exactly. Well, that's their job. I mean, you know, the, the, okay, there's two aspects to this. One, the military are always looking for the next job. I mean, like any other organization, we need to justify the budget. And we won't be in Afghanistan forever. What's next? So there's that sort of self-serving justification. But at the same time, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the sort of brains of the Army, if you will forgive, or the armed forces, um, have the, the, the job of, of detecting emerging threats to the United States security. Well, what's the emerging threat? And the emerging threat is climate change on many fronts. So even if they're not supposed to, it's not good for your career under Mr. Bush to be seen publicly uh, to be looking into climate change, in the back room, of course they're doing it. They would be irresponsible not to, and they were. One of the nightmare scenarios that you lay out uh, in the book has to do with the United States and Mexico. Obviously, the Mexican border, the 2,000-mile border, is, it's the only place in the world where a third-world country has a contiguous land uh, border with an advanced, developed uh, country. Your, uh, lay out your scenario for what could conceivably happen at the U.S.-Mexico border. Well, um, Mexico and Central America, and most of the Caribbean as well, um, are um, going to lose a lot of food production quite early in the warming process. It's all in the subtropics. The subtropics basically get hit by a severe f lack of rain. And in some places, the farms just dry up and blow away. Well, when that happens, particularly in Central America and Mexico, the first response of people is you go north. I mean, it's, it's a well-established pattern. If you're in trouble, you need money, you can't feed your family, head north. Um, and, you know, the current U.S. border is organized to allow that to occur to a certain extent. It's fairly porous, catch some, let some through, um, and it provides a safety valve for the Mexican state. All of this is fine when what you're talking about is a half a million people a year getting across the border, many of whom go home after the harvest, that sort of thing. But if you start losing food production and people are seriously hungry in Mexico, Guatemala, and so on, the numbers are going to swell. And what the United States Army thinks is that... You know, at some point in the next 10 or 15 years, as those numbers swell, popular demand in the United States for something to be done will make the Congress instruct the armed forces to close the Mexican border for real, which you can do, but only if you're willing to kill people. I mean, that's the dirty little secret about frontiers. We can seal frontiers. You know, two words, iron curtain. We know how to do this, but you have to be willing to kill people if you're really going to seal a frontier 2,000 miles long. You can't do it with goodwill. The U.S. Army doesn't want to do that because it can see that this would cause the most grievous social divisions in the United States, U.S. Army killing Hispanic people at the Mexican border, but they anticipate that they will be ordered to. Your book begins with, to say the least, a nightmare scenario, the year 2045. I was wondering if you could just read us the scenario. Since the final collapse of the European Union in 2036, under the stress of mass migration from the southern to the northern members, the reconfigured Northern Union, just France, Benelux, Germany, Scandinavia, Poland, has succeeded in closing its borders to any further refugees from the famine-stricken Mediterranean countries. Italy, south of Rome, has been largely overrun by refugees from even harder-hit North African countries and is no longer part of an organized state. 
But Spain, northern Italy, and Turkey have all acquired nuclear weapons.